Now we have with us Dr. Kailesh Kaushik. He is an assistant professor of media studies at the School of Arts and Humanities, Christ deemed to be university. He has completed his PhD from Florida State University. He has attended many conferences at the national level. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for thank you, Omni. Um, hello, Robi, sir. Long time no see. It's uh, <laughs> been a while. Uh, okay, I am going to uh, just share my screen. Okay, I hope this is visible. Um, yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rajesh, sir, for the introduction to the quantitative side of research methods. I shall be dealing with the qualitative side, slightly different from the way quantitative research is done, but certainly something which is necessary and to answer certain kind of questions, you do need to adopt these kind of uh, research methods. Um, one thing I really want to reiterate is the fact which Rajesh sir mentioned, the fact that uh, you tend to understand research and you tend to know about it only once you start doing it. How much ever small the research project might be, uh, only once you do it do you understand the multiple problems which arise with it, but most importantly, the kind of rush that you get uh, in doing research itself. Now, qualitative research method certainly is a completely different way of doing research because in the very way that we approach a specific topic and the way that we collect uh, information or empirical material, or even the way we try to know something about is different. And unfortunately, I shall be rushing through a few of the methods uh, and at the end, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so basically, what's the difference? What's the difference between qualitative and quantitative research? Like I said, the first difference comes down to epistemology, which means how do we know about something, right? Now, one way certainly is for you to find out uh, through a survey or find out through an experiment. Now, through the experiment, you're trying to find out about something. So epistemology deals with how do you know about something? And the basic difference between the two research methods is here, where on one side, you're trying to run a survey, you're trying to get um, uh, an experiment to maybe uh, see cause and effect. Uh, but here, certainly in qualitative research, you're not trying to do that. You're trying to more, more often than not trying to figure out what is happening. Uh, trying to understand why a certain phenomena is like that, right? Um, and the second difference comes in the way of the truth, you know, the truth with the capital T and the article the. Now, in qualitative research, you do understand the fact that social, uh, you know, aspects and issues come up with multiple of people, multiple of perspectives, where you can't pin down one single truth. So in the very act of understanding society itself, uh, you tend to move away from just one single truth, uh, which certainly might be attributed to the postmodern turn, but it has been like that for way many years before the postmodern turn itself. Uh, you're looking here more at description instead of numbers, um, you know, and like in quantitative methods, it's very important to bring it down to numbers. In qualitative research, it is extremely important to have description. And what Geertz always talked about was this phrase called thick description, which means you get so much information about a particular thing that you tend to understand how a specific person is trying to deal with a situation or how a working condition of a journalist is, or even how a specific person has consumed a certain kind of media, right? Uh, 
Second, I mean, the next difference is also extremely important where we depend on context and objective distance. Now, most often in quantitative methodology, you have an objective distance where you're almost like a social scientist, an extremely positivist way of approaching a question where there's an objective distance where you are, you know, at a distance trying to study something. However, in most of the qualitative research studies, especially because of the way the, uh, data, the empirical material is collected, you tend to uh, reflect and you tend to recognize the fact that you are also part of the same system that you're studying. And you tend to also recognize the context which in which this study is um, you know, being conducted and how it actually you know, affects the results of the study itself. More importantly, Qualitative research is an iterative journey, which is of exploration and discovery. Remember, if you want to find out cause and effect, and like most of you might have already know, your choice of methodologies depends upon your research question. Now, if your research question is looking for cause and effect, you certainly will not choose qualitative research because a qualitative research project will not yet give you cause to effect. You will have to choose a quantitative experiment for that. However, if you want to explore a certain uh, specific aspect, if you want to discover how a specific social system is working, how a specific, specific set of community is trying to navigate society, you use qualitative methodology. And what, what does it mean when I say it is an iterative journey, which means unlike many of the methods in quantitative methodology, in qualitative methodology, you sometimes start off with literally knowing nothing about the subject and you tend to discover something a little added to your analysis. So almost data collection and analysis happen side by side sometimes because it is a way where you, as soon as you collect some data, you analyze it there and then and see how it can be used for your next um, you know, collection of either interview or any other thing. So, as I actually go through the methods, you might have a better understanding of how this iterative process works, but it's something very, very important in the qualitative uh, realm. Um, moving on, you have a multitude of options uh, to look at, but I shall be focusing on three major things in this uh, session. So you have qualitative interviews, you have focus groups, ethnography, textual analysis, discourse analysis, and the practice of grounded theory itself. Now, I am focusing on qualitative interviews, focus groups, and textual analysis purely because, especially in media research, off late, this has been uh, a, more common than the other kinds of analysis. Certainly, discourse analysis also has been very, very frequent. But for the purposes of this particular workshop, I'll be choosing only three of these. So let's start with interviews itself. Right. And when do you do qualitative interviews? Qualitative interviews is a very, very interesting method to get to know how people deal with social situations, how people uh, encounter society, how they go through the usual lives. If you want to understand a very specific way people handle something, you use qualitative interviews. And in qualitative interviews, it is very important to know that it is an in-depth conversation. Unlike a survey, which is very, very to the point, qualitative interviews lie on the extreme other end of the survey. Here it is in-depth conversation that you have with a person. And most often than not, it is semi-structured. Now, what does it mean it's semi-structured? Unlike a survey where you have the exact same questions being asked to everyone, here in qualitative interviews, you have an interview guide. Now, this guide is nothing but a set of questions, maybe 10 or 15 questions, which will ensure that you ask the respondent all the necessary questions you want to ask about. It need not be in the same order. It need not be in the same words that you have used, but you need to cover those many questions. And that is where the semi-structuredness of qualitative interviews comes. And what's the advantage of this? Certainly the advantage is in conversation, people tend to give you a lot more information. They tend to be descriptive, right? And that is what you also have to aim for. So the interview guide in a qualitative interview becomes extremely important. 
for not only ensuring that you cover all the aspects you want to know about, but also to ensure that you don't swerve away from the things that you're talking. More often than not, there is a possibility of the respondent talking about something completely differently and your data being completely useless or the material being useless. Now, the interview guide ensures that you steer back the conversation to the things which are required and continue with the interview. Now, there are a few things on to understand, and especially you need to know how to talk to strangers. And remember, qualitative interviews just doesn't stop at uh, media research. If you're going into PR, if you're going to journalism, these are things which will be useful there also. Now, one of the most important things that you do take is informed consent of the respondent themselves. So even before you start the interview, you tell them what the research is about. You tell them, this is how I'm going to record it. This is what I'm going to do. You give them complete information so that they know that whatever they are revealing to you, they are aware of it and they are okay with it, right? So an informed consent is a very, very important thing which you need to take from the respondent. It might be written or it, you might also record it, right? Saying that, hey, are you okay with me asking these questions? And are you okay with you telling me all the information that you're about to say? Now, within the informed consent, sometimes people might uh, want you to not reveal their name and you should be okay with it. You should also be okay with the respondent stopping the interview at any time, saying that, hey, now I'm not comfortable, please stop it and it should be all right. The same goes with recording. It, the respondent needs to know that the interview needs to be recorded and it will be recorded. You can tell them how. It might be an audio recording. It can be a video recording. It's up to you. Third, always keep the interview guide in handy, right? The interview guide should always be there so that it, you will be sure as to what is the route you will be taking while talking to strangers. And most often you might be talking to someone who you might not and meet again or come from an extremely different background in society, right? Now, as Rajesh sir mentioned, there are types of questions you can ask in a survey and there is a specific way for it. Similarly, in qualitative interviews also, you have a very specific way of asking questions. Uh, here again, going back to what qualitative research is all about, if you need to have a thick description of something, you need to ask extremely descriptive questions. You should not ask binary questions in qualitative interviews. So for example, you, instead of asking a question like, do you like movies or not? The obvious answer will be yes or no. Now there is no description which is coming out of it. Instead of that, you might want to ask, what kind of movies do you really enjoy? Right? Where they start describing, or uh, what kind of movies do you like? where they try to start and explain that they kind of like certain kind of movies, why they like it, etc., etc., right? Or make sure you elicit a response which is extremely descriptive. For example, instead of asking, what are your hobbies? Which normally comes with an answer which is like, you know, I like watching TV, listening to music, drawing. So there's just a list, right? But you would want more of a description of the same. How would you ask the question then? A common way normally which we use is, um, imagine you have a Sunday off, how do you spend your time, right? Automatically, now this gives the respondent a way to think about what they're going to do on a Sunday and they're going to give you an extremely descriptive answer. So try to make your questions as descriptive as possible. And one rule which is always followed in qualitative interviews is you never ask the research question to the respondent. Now, if your research question is about finding out how the labor conditions are there in a specific factory, you are not going to just directly ask, so what are the labor conditions in your factory? You will never ask the respondent a research question directly. What you will ask are questions which will describe the conditions of work to you. So for example, you will ask, take me through your daily routine at the factory. You will ask, um, how, do you, uh, how do you like your work? What do you normally do? What is the routine during lunch break, right? You ask questions which will give you content about 
something, but you never ask the research question directly. Now, I have already mentioned this multiple times, but you need to ensure that there's an extremely thick description, extremely elaborate description in the form of the answer. And most often in uh, qualitative interviews, you do transcribe on the uh, things that you have recorded and then you analyze them. So when you do transcribe, if you want to know whether you have done a good job in a qualitative interview, most often your transcription would look like one line question, a large paragraph answer, one line question, a large paragraph answer, which means the respondent has talked a lot more than you have and you have a lot of material to analyze. Now, a very common thing which happens, and this happens way too often, is the awkward silence. Because you're talking to a stranger, you ask a question, and there is silence, right? And many of you might have experienced this even in class, where somebody asks a question, and there is absolute silence which follows. Now, remember, especially when you're doing qualitative interviews, make use of the silence. It is the silence which will push the other respondent to respond more. Because as human beings and as social uh, beings, we always tend to try to move away from awkwardness and try to fill in the gap, right? So you ask a question and own that silence. Own that silence in a way where you'll be able to actually you know, benefit from it, right? Um, similarly, as I told you, it is an iterative process, which means you tend to actually have a conversation, do an interview with one respondent, see what they have responded, maybe change a question or two, maybe change the way you might ask a question, maybe uh, change the interview guide a little, go back, interview another respondent. So this process keeps on going over and over again. Right? So it is not the same set of questions that you normally um, you know, give the uh, respondents, but it changes a bit based on the previous interview that you have actually done. So this is one of the major ways where it is, you get descriptions from various different people in an extremely detailed way, which gives you a lot of you know, content to actually analyze. And the analysis as such can be multiple, and I shall get to that in a bit. Moving on to focus groups. Now, how is focus groups slightly different? Now, unlike qualitative interviews, where you talk to um, an individual one-on-one, -on -one, most often focus groups are done where you are trying to get a description from a group of people. Now, most often, I'll give you the example because I normally do labor research and this is something I do take very seriously is focus groups because think of a factory where, you know, people are working. Now, if I need to know the working conditions in the factory, instead of going and interviewing each and every worker, I can do a focus group. Why? Because I know all the workers do spend a specific time doing a specific work within a specific factory. So they have some common experience in a day which I want to know about. So you can do two or three small groups of focus groups, which might have about eight to 10 people. And you ask them questions, similar questions like how you do it in qualitative interviews, which are again, descriptive in nature. However, it, is, it will not be you who will be asking question, but you will actually have a moderator who will actually guide a discussion. You'll ask a question, somebody will talk something, somebody might add something to it, but you are away from the focus group taking points as a researcher. Most often it is advised to have the moderator as someone other than who the researcher himself is, because that allows you to actually check and note down the various things which are coming up in the sample. Now, most often when you're trying to look at trends and attitudes, you do use focus groups. If you're into advertising, most often when you do actually go into advertising agencies, they always do focus groups to understand whether a specific advertisement is going to click or not, right? Here also you have very clearly defined topics and you also have open-ended questions. What does it mean to have open-ended questions? It means that again here, 
it will always be descriptive answers. You know, initially opening of a focus group might have a few uh, ice breaking questions like, hey, do you all watch this program or uh, do you like this food? Yes, yes. Oh, many of you like it. But as the focus group continues, the discussion is channeled by open ended questions. It's certainly more descriptive in nature again, so that you get a lot of material to actually analyze. Now, again, you can certainly record this. Remember, informed consent for everything is required. Moving on, third one, and again, I'm uh, rushing through this because of constraints of time, but like, you can certainly ask questions uh, in the end. Uh, the next part is this textual analysis. Now, in the qualitative interviews and in focus groups, you are directly dealing with people, right? You're not uh, dealing with anything else, but directly dealing with people. In textual analysis, you're dealing with a text. Now, when you think of textual analysis, do think of it as a process of interpretation and meaning, right? And when you think of text itself, when I do say textual analysis, it does not stop at the written word. It's not just about uh, you analyzing the news article or just uh, you know a novel. A textual analysis will always have all kinds of text. It might be a movie, it might be a message, it might be a meme, a gif, it might be a song, song lyrics, it might be greeting cards. Everything is considered as text. Now, what normally happens in textual analysis is you are putting everything in a specific context and interpreting either the representation or the visual politics or the kind of words which are being used so that to understand how is meaning derived in a very specific context. Now, you need to understand that this kind of analysis can be of various different kinds. It is not just, um, it, it's not just how you see it. And remember, this is not opinion, right? You are not just giving an opinion that, hey, I don't like this movie. Now that will not, um, you know, amount to textual analysis. And I'll tell you why. Um, it's purely because when you're doing textual analysis, uh, there is a very clear way of how you approach it. Now, these perspectives which you normally see on uh, the screen is when you do look at a movie, there are various ways of doing textual analysis. One certainly is, is, is an extremely personal one where you tend to break down as to what in the specific text, be it a movie. Let's take movie as an example of a text. What specific in the movie that you actually liked and how what made you like it, which, which is more of an opinion-based thing, which you normally see especially in movie reviews. But once you go deeper into textual analysis is where all the other things come up. You can do a historical textual analysis to see how that specific text developed over time and what does it mean for it to now have this specific form and meaning. It can also be technical where the kind of technology being used, VFX, camera angles, color, sound, uh, mise-en-scene, why and what is the meaning coming out of because of all of that. It can certainly be an ethical cultural analysis where you can do as to what does it specifically mean for a text to be shown and to be interpreted by people in a specific culture where there might be misrepresentation, there might be a lot of uh, misunderstanding within the changing of the meaning itself. And last but one of the most important things is a critical way of looking into text. So most often textual analysis does have a critical realm where you look at how power functions within the text, whether the dominant ideology is being reinforced in a movie or the news article, or is it being resisted? What are the new things which are coming up and how is the hegemonical views of the society being either challenged or reinforced? Now you look at all of this, not just within the text itself, but also the larger structures of media. Now, text is closely related to discourse, and I did mention discourse analysis, but I won't again go deep into it. But 
as an extension of text discourse if you take it will be a slightly more larger uh, uh, view that you will be taking while you're doing the analysis now most often textual analysis comes down to the research of meaning right you need to understand that anything and everything that we actually create um, we also create within a very specific social system now this very lecture that i'm giving the very seminar that you're attending can itself be a text and you can analyze it in multiple ways saying that why am i giving all this information what is the use of this information that is being shared what else can be added what was missed right so there are various ways you need to understand that the meaning of every text that you read every text that you see that you watch has and is created within a social structure and automatically it does have a specific way of conveying the same now there are ways which you can actually connect to this right you can look at semiotics right how is meaning formed especially in the form of where meaning is arbitrary why is it in some places a swastika is a religious symbol while you move slightly west the swastika becomes a symbol of hate right and how does that change in meaning function it can be rhetoric where you might want to analyze as to what is this text trying to do like is it trying to persuade me is it trying to make me believe is it trying to push me to do something you know you can study that here again you can do a critical analysis of meaning as to how and why did certain things assume a certain meaning why is it always seen as hard work equals success is it really true right you tend to look at these things from the specificity of language of culture of social setting and this specific line of research is extremely influenced by not only sociology but a lot of literary studies and literary criticism too and certainly a lot from language and linguistics and this is where even in media especially when we live in such a hyper mediated world we do understand that everything that we see around and the way we understand society itself most often is through the kind of stuff we see in the media and if the media is generating this kind of meaning it becomes extremely important to understand who's creating this meaning what is the benefit of creating this meaning and that's where the act of textual analysis becomes extremely extremely important now finally just to end um, with a very quick note uh, a lot of questions normally are asked about in general like how rajesh sir ended uh, his uh, session about the validity and reliability of qualitative research uh, where they say hey this is just your opinion you're giving it doesn't seem like good research it's it does not hold the test of uh, rigor and everything now certainly um, because there is no actual measurement involved uh, a validity of qualitative research is still can be checked now first and foremost thing we need to understand that it is in the interpretivist tradition that qualitative research comes which means you're trying to understand what a phenomena means you're trying to understand how a social issue is being navigated you try to understand right you're trying to explore you are not certainly uh, trying to generalize nowhere in a qualitative research project do you see extreme generalization because the very way we are trying to understand something does not give us the tools to generalize across but you can certainly give an explanation as to how you think a certain phenomena is happening right now how do humans understand the social world and their particular social context is something which is one of the broadest things a qualitative researcher tries to do now how do you check for a good qualitative research one it is always and always has an extremely detailed thick description uh, and that is very very important even while you are writing uh, the research project it's extremely important to have that second more than most of the quantitative techniques you do have a very prolonged engagement which means 
if you are doing interviews, for example, or if you're doing focus group, you do spend a lot of time with the respondents. You do have a lot of engagement in the fact that you talk to them for a long time, you get a lot of information. The prolonged engagement is a very, very important uh, aspect of qualitative research to know that you have actually gotten enough to actually make an analysis. Uh, one of the most important things of qualitative research is reflexivity and power, which means unlike quantitative techniques where you are an objective researcher, here you are a subjective researcher who is within the societal norms trying to figure out a specific question, right? You need to be reflexive about your own position in society you need to be reflexive about your own power dynamics which lay between you and the respondent. So for example, if I am a male talking to a woman, there is already a power dynamics which is there. You need to be aware of it and actually note down these power relations and the kind of responses which might uh, you know, actually differ because of the same, right? And more importantly, the kind of exploration which exists within qualitative research should be shown along with the kind of flaws that come up, come with it. It is not that you're gonna have one number and it's gonna be the answer to all. Qualitative research most often times is a starting point where you try to understand something which has not been looked at before or something which you tend to or want to understand in a particular situation. Sometimes a quantitative research project might generalize across the board, but there might be a, some outlier which has not been included and you want to understand how does it change there. And that's where you use qualitative research to understand these outlying uh, things where it requires not just numbers, but a very thick description to see what a specific social phenomena in a special specific social context happens. And these are some of the ways that you can do it. And I know I have gone through a lot in, in a very short span of maybe about 25 minutes, but I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, and please let me know if you have any questions about either qualitative interviews or focus groups or textual analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So do we have any questions? Uh, Kela, sir? Yes. So if you could just tell the students as to, so some of them are actually conducting focus group discussions. Okay. So, um, you know, where do you draw the line uh, wherein how to not interfere or if the person is actually speaking, if the participant is actually speaking a lot, but you actually want them to sort of stop speaking and you want to get to the next point. Right. So there are like those practical uh, difficulties that students might face when they do a focus group. So just a uh, brief on that. Right. Uh, okay. So one thing which you really need to understand is you also have to have trust in the moderator that the moderator will uh, ensure that there won't the whole conversation is not taken over by one specific person in a focus group. And it does happen. Um, this is where you can actually even send out messages to the moderator asking, hey, we already have that uh, perspective. Can you ask somebody else to talk? And that, that will certainly help where uh, you also tend to change the question, right? Um, you can also, as a moderator, you still have the power to say, hey, you already answered about this. Why don't we hear from you? You know, it, it's perfectly okay to do that in, in a focus group. Also, you, you know, there are very basic ways where you can actually interrupt uh, a person. If it is going way too long, a very common thing which uh, researchers use, and this is, uh, this is just a trick which is normally used, is where you just drop the pen and pick it up and say, sorry, right? There's that disruption which is there now and say like, sorry, sorry, I was just uh, confused. Uh, can you just hold on, let somebody else speak. So. You know, you can create those small distractions to just bring in some uh, break in between if somebody else, somebody is talking way too much. Um, that is one way. But most often what happens 
when you're responding itself, because you're the moderator, whoever you have employed as the moderator, uh, they are asking the questions. Most often people do stop and uh, you, you know give some break. So you, you have to be in control of the narrative itself, of who gets to talk how much. And most often what can also help is taking notes of what they have already written and if they are repeating and this happens a lot where somebody tries to tell a story and keeps going on and on you can say hey i think you already mentioned that can somebody else relate to it right so making that smooth transition is extremely important focus group for two things one certainly for not seeming rude and you know not blocking off someone but second it will ensure that all of them are also listening to it and you get all of their perspectives also. So in a focus group, it is extremely important to ensure that everybody's voice is heard at least once or maybe twice so that it does not seem like you have three people who are talking and three people who are extremely silent. So that shouldn't happen. Uh, so that's something you can, uh, you also need to control. You also can have, and this is a practice with some of the focus group moderators do, you have certain um, you know, shifting questions, which means transitional questions, where if suddenly there's no conversation and you feel very awkward, um, you have a few transitional questions where you're like, okay, we talked about X, Y, and Z. Does anybody have thoughts about A, B, and C? So that, you know, they start talking about that and then you can direct the whole conversation again back to the topic, whatever is required. So these are some of the ways where um, you tend to, uh, you know, ensure that everybody talks. One very important thing I would like to add is you will be recording the focus group too. Uh, and because you might have to transcribe the same, ensure that at the beginning of the recording, you make each and every uh, person identify themselves. And you ask the moderator to direct the question. So for example, if there is um, you know, Varsha and all of them in the focus group and I'm the moderator, I'll ask a question and then I'll say, Varsha, do you want to answer, right? So that name marker or any kind of marker is very important while you're analyzing, it helps you a lot because otherwise you'll have to remember each and everybody's voice and try to pin down what they said. So ask the moderator to call out their name and ask for the answer. That will help a lot. Or sometimes what happens while you're having the discussion, somebody finishes talking and somebody continues, right? Where you can't have the name marker. At the end of their conversation, the moderator can say, that's a very good point, X, Y, and Z. Does anybody else have anything to say? So this will help you in the analysis phase because you will know who actually said that and what somebody responded. So I think these are some of the tips you can keep in mind while doing focus groups. Varsha, does that help? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.